So this session maybe was a, a little vague to folks just based on the, the one announcement or the, the one line item in the program. Uh, if you read through the, the abstract or the proceedings, there was a little bit more information, but what we want this session to be is active participation. We want this to be uh, a workshop. We want to gather, we want this to be a sharing of ideas in, um, in multiple ways. It's about active participation in livestock and poultry environmental sustainability initiatives. And the uh, session itself, uh, we are thankful that we have um, sponsors. Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy um, is sponsoring um, a couple of sessions as part of the conference as a whole. But I also want to acknowledge National Pork Board and American Egg Board have also contributed money to this, to this conference to make this, uh, make this event possible, frankly for all of us to be here. So we're appreciate, appreciative of our, um, of our partners, not only for this session, but for the conference as a whole. And you'll feel just part of me while I get the slides, slides up. So the reason that we're here is that at multiple, level, multiple levels, at the integrator level, at the farm level, at the industry level, there's various sustainability programs going on and evolving at a furious pace. They all have unique goals, metrics, and approaches, which makes this a very confusing space as well. Um, there is no definitive path in any one of these programs for uh, whether it's for, the, for pigs or for poultry or for dairy or, or beef for that matter, there is no definitive path for these different farms of these different types to meet different sustainability program goals or metrics. But with that ambiguity, there is some opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity for some decision-making. There's a lot of opportunity for innovation. And that I think is where LPLC has a, has a vital role. Meeting these sustainability goals, some that are set and some that are still emerging is gonna take a community. You know, meeting these sustainability goals uh, so these sustainability goals are, are designed in part for on-farm uh, on farm adoption, but that's, it's not solely on the farmers, it's not solely on the producers to make these goals come to reality. It really takes community of people on and off the farm willing to support these measurements, communication, and technology development for them to come to fruition. And so how, how do we do that? That's the point of, part of the point of this session. So what is this session or who is doing this session? Well, I want to invite up uh, my, uh, my co-panelists for this session to give, a, uh, give an introduction and some of their background. I'm Erin Cordes. I'm with the University of Minnesota and also part of, uh, part of LPLC, just as all of you attending here, frankly, are part of LPLC. Uh, and so I'll, I'll moderate the session today, but it's really because of the efforts and the, the programs and the just some of the visioning by our livestock groups that we have this session. So I'd like to, I'll have, have them come up, um, give a little brief background on themselves as well as uh, some, some other background information just on some of their programs. We are sharing a mic, so you'll excuse us as we pass off the mic between us, but uh, maybe Michelle, do you mind starting? I wanna invite Michelle Rossman with Innovation Center for US Dairy. Thank you, Erin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Rossman. I'm the Vice President uh, for Environmental Stewardship with the DMI and the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy. So a little bit of background on myself. Um, I have a lifetime in production agriculture, grew up on a small family farm in Pennsylvania. My husband and I still uh, farm today. We are in southeast Minnesota. We raise purebred Angus cattle, have a hog nursery and run a couple thousand acres of crops. Um, my role uh, at DMI is all about uh, bringing the industry together to catalyze adoption of currently available management practices and technology for dairy farmers around the country as they understand the impact of what they're doing on a daily basis on the environment and how we can help them in that journey to understand their current farm footprint and make uh, really good technical decisions that will also uh, contribute to the long-term economic viability of their farm. In 2020, U.S. Dairy sent, set 
set their 2050 environmental goals, and they include to achieve greenhouse gas neutrality, optimize water use while maximizing recycling, and improve water quality. And for those of you in the room, um, you do have some handouts in the middle of your table that um, have a lot more information and details about our, our goals. So uh, today, really looking forward to understand how uh, we all work together across our supply chains um, and with all of you who really focus on farmer education and bringing good technical um, information to our farmers, as well as conducting that, that great research that supports um, all of the decisions that, and, and uh, management technologies that we offer up for our farmers to understand how we all um, continually build great networks and programs uh, to support farmers around the country. Uh, now I'd like to call up Marguerite Tan with National Pork Board. Thanks, Erin. Um, so yeah, my name is Marguerite Tan. I'm uh, the Director of Environmental Programs with the National Pork Board. I've been with the National Pork Board for about two and a half years now. Um, I am an engineer by training or an engineer by training as, as probably is more popular amongst us. Um, Prior to my time at National Pork Board, I uh, worked for a large, lot of large integrators doing their crop as well as uh, livestock management, particularly on the environmental side. Um, I started off as a consulting engineer. I wanted to go into extensions, but that was uh, right when all of the... Uh, funding was cut. Um, and then most recently, before I joined the National Pork Board, I was the senior environmental engineer for Hormel Foods, uh, developing and implementing their environmental and sustainability programs across their farm operations, as well as their food processing facilities. Um, I was raised on a grain farm, so that is my background, um, which it's a blessing and a curse. As we've started the sustainability journey, it's fantastic because I, you know, I'm that practical, implementable, and is it economically feasible person? If, if one of those is not on the, you know, if, if I have to mark one of those off the list, guess what? It's not going to work on a farm operation, but that also puts blinders on me because I was raised in this, in the industry. So there are things where somebody will look outside of that box or somebody, maybe I should say who's outside of that box. They're looking into the box and they're like, well, duh, it's so simple. Why don't you do this? But it's not something we can see from inside of the box, but it's a brilliant idea. And it's like, wow, why didn't we think of that before? It's so simple and brilliant. So there are really, in my mind, there are roles for everybody in this journey both from the folks who are inside of the box, as well as my very much appreciated folks who are outside of the box and looking around and going, well, duh, here you go. Um, so I am of the belief that swine production and, and animal agriculture as a whole category, we are part of this climate change solution. And I say that from the aspect of we can create renewable natural gas. We can create renewable fertilizers. We can create renewable biofuels. And in the old adage of, if it can't be grown, it has to be mined. These are all things that we currently mine out of the ground right now. And if we use livestock to fill that void, that in place of what is being mined, we can create renewable and more sustainable systems. So with that said, the big challenge we have in, I feel like the livestock industry is the ability to verify those improvements that we're making to be part of that solution. So in the past two years, the National Pork Board has released their first ever US Pork Industry Sustainability Report. We have set aggressive industry-wide sustainability goals, which were developed by our producers for our producers, as well as uh, we are now providing third-party verified on-farm sustainability reports for our producers, which are farm specific, which is a fabulous first step. And with those three things that we've done in the last couple of years, we have three goals to come out of that. 
Number one is to quantify these on-farm practices. We know we have a lot of really good on-farm practices. We've just never taken the time to quantify them. The second thing is measuring our collective impact by aggregating all of that information and learning about those on-farm practices. And when I say that we are collect, you know, aggregating that information, we are collecting real on-farm data. So far, a lot of the industries and animal agriculture in the sustainability space, we've been reliant on models. Well, models are only as good as the data that they were based off of. And they're not based off of 60,000 pig farmers worth of data. And so that's our goal is to get all of 60,000 of our producers participating, and it's all voluntary, into the sustainability database to be able to collectively have that information and be able to tell the world, this is actually what we are doing. This is not what the model data is saying we're doing. And lastly, you can't improve on what you don't measure. So this is our way to measure what we're doing now and set ways to improve and set improvement goals, which circles back around to the aggressive sustainability goals that we've set with a baseline of 2015 that we will meet by 2030. Um, so if you're interested uh, in any of that stuff, if you go to uh, porkcares.org or porkcheckoff.org, there is more information on that. And with that, I will turn it back over to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. And then our, um, I want to invite Hema Prado with American Egg Board. Uh, just give me one second, Hema. I'm going to move your, uh, make your picture. A little more evident for people. There you are. Okay, go ahead, Hima. All right, you can hear me and you can see me? Yes, we can. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be there in person today. Um, my name is Hema Prado. Um, some of you might know me by my maiden name, Hema Subramanian. I used to be, uh, I'm currently with American Egg Board. I'm the director of sustainability there. I joined American Egg Board in June of 2021. So I haven't quite hit the year mark. Um, however, Waste to Worth is nothing new to me. I um, used to be at uh, US EPA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and had the thrill of engaging with Waste to Worth in, in several years past, having been on the planning committee when I was in our Office of wa um, Wastewater Management and focusing on animal agriculture and manure management there. Uh, later in my career at EPA, I was in the administrator's office, and I finished my career at career there as a senior advisor for agriculture. So I covered all agricultural issues at EPA uh, and about 10 years into the time at EPA, um, which was about 20 years into my career, I, I had uh, some life changes and some time to sort of think about how I could, uh, you know, sort of pivot to a position of really getting a hands-on approach of working with farmers and producers on solutions for sustainability and an, and an opportunity came along. And so I ended up uh, at AEB. And so now I'm with the egg industry and I am still thinking manure a lot of the time, um, but you know, looking across the board at how we can as an industry build a sustainability program uh, before I came along, there was no director of sustainability. I was the first one. Uh, AEB created the position and then I was hired. Uh, so what, what was interesting about that is the buy-in um, for the egg industry to create a sustainability initiative was there before I came. And so that's been a wonderful embracing uh, that I've seen in the industry. And I think there's a few reasons for that. One is you know, admittedly, we're a little later to the game. Uh, the egg industry has just started on its sustainability journey on an industry-wide basis in some ways. Uh, but I think, you know, that that provides an opportunity to, to, you know, learn and work with others who've been doing it, you know, for longer than us. Um, but also, I think, 
you know, the egg industry in particular has a supply chain where the farmers are a little bit closer to the customer in the value chain. And so the pressures that we're all seeing in society and with the consumers and with markets is closer and hitting home closer for, for farmers. So, um, you know, it's been an exciting uh, journey. I'll share a little bit more about what we're doing a little later, I believe, in, in the session. Um, but uh, just to sum it up, before I even came, that we had done a life cycle assessment uh, that was a landmark study. It looked at 50 years of production um, between 1960 and 2010 and showed some uh, pretty great um, environmental uh, progress that had happened over the footprint of that 50 years. Um, but the egg industry changed. As you all know, cage-free production and other manure handling system updates happened after 2010 in a significant way. And so uh, we're, we're investing now in, a, in an LCA. We're also engaged in a broader supply chain initiative to build a framework for the poultry and egg industry. So although I'm here representing eggs, I also um, can speak a bit on behalf of the poultry and egg initiative that, that we're a part of. Um, so, you know, I'm excited to be here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but um, I've always felt that the um, LPLC community is critical um, to the science and the success and the innovation that can drive sustainability for animal agriculture. And I think given the spotlight that all of us in the animal ag industry are in now to find solutions and really um, find validity and, um, and real genuine uh, progress to answer customer demands, we all can look to you as great partners in, in our journeys, no matter where we are in, in our journey. So thank you. And I, I think I'll turn it back to you, Erin. Thank you. Well, and the last piece of our puzzle for, for today is all of you in the room. We are hoping to create a product through this brief time that we have here together. And that was the reason for passing out that, um, that sign up sheet. Um, so if you don't mind sharing your name and contact information, because as we develop this product that's, that's gonna come out of today, you know, we wanna be able to share back with you for some of that first review, just to make sure that we are capturing the thoughts, the great thoughts that are in this room. Ultimately, the goal here today is to draft a collective logic model. Uh, I'll put a few more details up, but it's uh, not, a, not an overly complex document. But what we want to do is provide this, provide a model, basically provide some justification of where we are and where we want to go in terms of building a community of support for producer engagement in livestock industry sustainability initiatives. As part of this logic model, we want to we want to look at you know what is the situation and so at the start of today's uh, workshop we'll, we'll present some of the situation we want to refine the outcomes we'll present some some ideas uh, as far as outcomes as to where we want to get but we want to make sure that those match with what you're what you're seeing what you're feeling as well uh, then we're going to talk about activities prioritize some activities and that's going to be the meat of our of our workshop today and then identify what are those needs that we need, what do we need to make that a reality? There are a lot of assumptions, external factors and, and evaluation opportunities that are, that are a good part of a logic model as well. And so I encourage you to uh, note, those, um, note those where you can. If, uh, if you aren't familiar with a logic model, uh, very simplistically, it's, it's broken into some sections where we look at the situation, we look at inputs, what we have or what we need. Uh, we document what are some activities that we can do to ultimately generate some outcomes. And we can look at outcomes as being very sh somewhat short term, just change in knowledge of a particular audience or a particular group. What are some changes in action or changes in situation? Are there any questions about just a logic model in general? Part of the reason for a logic model, uh, and that's as the, as the premise for today, is a logic model is the basis for a lot, of, a lot of grants, maybe explicitly, maybe less explicitly. But by building up these components, we also feel we're starting to put into place some of those, some of those ideas and some of that documentation that will support efforts moving forward. You know, as part of this workshop, uh, we, have, uh, we have limited time. So uh, we're going to have a lot of sharing of ideas at different points. 
just ask that you just watch your time um, so that we can make sure we can get through multiple people in our time available. You know, the ideas that we're sharing today are becoming, would become part of a collective model, just, just so you're aware, right? We'll try and capture the ideas uh, as best we can and, and make them part of a collective model. So we just keep that in mind. Uh, as we work through and we're generating ideas, we're having discussion, I do ask that people focus on asking clarifying questions instead of passing judgment on ideas. We are all coming from different places in the country, experience with different systems, different organizations for that matter. And so all of these perspectives are very valuable and, but they might not always agree. We might not always agree in terms of perspective with each other. So ask clarifying questions so that we can evolve together and make sure that we are coming at this as a community. We uh, will, there's likely gonna be some additional comments or info that we don't know what to do with in this present moment. And for that, uh, there is a Slido poll where we can use Q&A. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it'll come up on the next slide. I'll, I can get a slide up for everybody so that you can find that Q&A. If there are some of these thoughts, ideas that are coming up on the fly, you don't know really what to do with, please put them into the Slido Q&A poll. I uh, can't promise it'll be answered today, right? But still, we need to track what some of these questions are. And uh, we'll make space as best we can for both our in-person participants and then our online participants as well. Are there other thoughts, comments, suggestions for, for today as far as ground rules? Not very stringent ground rules. We'll keep going then. So if you... Um, if you do want to active, activate the, the Slido poll, let's hope it uh, works. If you go to slido.com on your smartphone and join uh, room uh, or code 777256, well, I can get started on the situation. Um, sustainability goals are, are personal, uh, whether it's at an industry level, a farm level, uh, an integrator level, industry goals are, are personal. And so, as we start to have some of these conversations about sustainability, especially since we are talking about a lot of different programs and a, some very specific goals amongst different industries, for example, you know, how do we have a collective conversation? Uh, one approach is to look at sustainability as a journey. So look at it as a road trip. Picture a group of friends crossing the country, right? Beginning of summer, they have a far off destination. They wanna cross the country. They want that experience. Similar with sustainability goals, I think there's a somewhat some broad vision, some broad mission as to what they want, what the group wants to accomplish. But it takes coming together, prioritizing what those goals are or what those priorities are for that trip or for that sustainability journey. And each of our groups, each of the livestock industries has made some different priorities. There, are, there is overlap, of course, but there is some priorities that come through in each, in each set of goals. In order to meet those, uh, those goals for those priorities, we need to pick some paths, we need to chart some courses. Now with sustainability and some of these uh, distant goals uh, crossing the country, we might have some, we know where we wanna to leave tomorrow, we know which path we wanna to take tomorrow, but we might not know every road that we're gonna take across the whole summer, right? We have, can chart some initial paths for action, but there's also some flexibility. We have to be available or we have to be open to detours along the way. We have to be open to new experiences and new opportunities, seeing the biggest ball of mud, right? That suddenly comes available on our trip. Uh, opportunities for some of these detours. And then there's this aspect of charting progress. How do we document how far we've come? How, is it by showing how much gas we've used? Is it by figuring out how much money we have left on our trip? Um, Marguerite, Michelle, and Hema, you know, they've, they've spoken to some of these goals and then how also some of the tracking. So how do we chart progress? So if we look at sustainability as part of this journey, this is, how we, this is one way that we can approach this conversation today. How do we help farmers? How do we help producers? How do we help the livestock and poultry industries on this journey? This particular slide uh, gives a very broad overview of the um, programs through the Net Zero Initiative, National Pork Board, and Amer uh, through 
through dairy, pork, and egg groups. Uh, as far as visions, as far as North Stars, there is some, uh, there's vision statements as to what each group wants to accomplish. And I don't know if Hima, uh, Marguerite, or Michelle, do you want me to just quickly give the overview of the table? Is that, is that okay? Um, we have different uh, baselines or starting points. You know, where are we starting from? And generally, it, it's tied back to one of their LCAs that were done at different points in time. Um, sometimes uh, there's going to be new there's going to be new analyses done over time as well. But the, in each industry, they have some different priorities. If we look through the list of key performance indicators priorities, they go by different names and different programs. Um, we do see some overlap. We see greenhouse gases, for example, in all of those. There's aspects about water quality, water use, and then there are some other priorities. These priorities are likely to change over time, too, for some of these, uh, for different organizations. Priorities are likely to shift and evolve with time as we learn more, as we have more opportunities to monitor different aspects. So keep in mind that nothing on this table in front of you is, is frankly fixed forever, right? We have a lot of opportunity in here. With these different programs, there are different timelines and uh, American Egg Board has yet to set their, their firm endpoint, but uh, we are talking 10, 20, 28 uh, years into the future. This isn't a tomorrow aspect. As far as tracking progress, the last column uh, with the different groups, there are different data collection mechanisms that are available right now. But this is also, I think, an area where we can talk about what are some other ways to help with some of the tracking of progress, whether it's re data recording, whether it's measurements, there's a lot of opportunity with this particular audience to look at data uh, tracking progress, I think. So there is no definitive path for meeting long-term goals. There are some ideas, there's some great ideas and there's some strong programs already in place, but there is still a lot of room for innovation. And there's still a lot of room for uh, a lot of other opportunities. At the same time, as these efforts are moving forward, at least based on my own experience, there is variable trust in this word sustainability and what it means and what, it, what it's gonna take on the part of individual farmers, on the part of individual producers. And so those of us that work in that technical space, you know, get, garnering trust is huge. And so how do we help in this, uh, both in our roles, but also in the sustainability space? And then just this need for support. So LPLC, our mission with LPLC is to provide on-demand access, on access to the nation's best science to be responsive to priority and emerging environmental issues affecting animal ag. So we're in a strong position, LPLC as a collective whole, all of us in this room, to participate in and support these initiatives. However, just like the sustainability initiatives, we need a roadmap. We need to chart some priorities for that action. And that's really what this logic model, what this workshop is about. So up on the screen, uh, we've listed out some outcomes, what some outcomes might look like if we are to work, if we are to build this community for support. These are some potential outcomes for change in knowledge, change in action, change in situation. Our first activity for the day, and I will put this back up, is to just look at this. Let's get our head in the space, talk about, look at what some of these outcomes are. What I'd like you to do is uh, with your neighbor, and if you don't have a neighbor, move a little bit closer to somebody. Um, we're gonna do a think pair share exercise. So take a couple minutes, five minutes, share ideas. I put up some guiding questions if you're interested. You know, are you confident that these are achievable outcomes? Well, if someone were proposing these as outcomes to a project, what would you ask them if you were reviewing them? Um, are additional outcomes necessary? So I'd like you to, in pairs, talk through these different questions. Uh, those that are online, um, 
feel free to use the chat or the Q&A. Probably the chat might be the easiest. Just make sure you are speaking to all attendees. Um, if you want to start putting in some ideas, uh, chatting back and forth. Um, but I'll give you till 4.06. Just have a conversation with your neighbor. Yes, Erica. Yep. Yeah, so the question was, put the outcomes back up, and yes, there we go. So take a few minutes with your neighbor, have a conversation. Okay, let's come back together. Now we are at the share part. And it's just a, a quick share. What was a key aspect of, of one of your conversations? This table mind sharing, just one aspect. You don't need to repeat your whole conversation, but what was something that, that was shared as far as these outcomes? Too many initiatives out there. Too many initiatives out there. So I'll, 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 I'm just going to repeat it for the benefit of the virtual audience. The, the comment was is that there are so many different initiatives, so, so many different sustainability programs. They're hard to track. And, and it's hard sometimes to find where they merge and, and where they diverge and to keep all that straight. Another comment perhaps from this table. So the, the comment was the, the measuring aspect is, is a little daunting. How, is, how do we make it easy on farm uh, by the bulk, by the majority of, of people. Did I, did I miss anything, Nancy, there? How about at the, the other table? But I'll share that, and that is uh, consumer engagement. So the comment was that consumers are not listed on the list of outcomes, right? And they are in to many, um, in many ways driving these conversations. And so where are they on this list of outcomes and what is that appropriate change? I bet there was a lot of other great ideas shared at the different tables. And again, if you had some thoughts that just we didn't have time to capture in some of these conversations, you can always put them into that Q&A, the Slido Q&A, or write them down and we will aggregate them after. Um, any other comments that the in-person audience want to share? Erica and then Ling. <laughs> So Erica is just reiterating that at these different levels, there are so many broad definitions of what, of what a sustainable system looks like. And it just becomes overwhelming. It becomes frustrating. Uh, and I think for a lot of us in this room, we interact with all these agencies and, and have that exposure. And we can only imagine what it is for the farmers and producers that we serve as well. Uh, Ling, did you have another comment? She she took it. <laughs> so so uh, the comment in the room is yes. Is it possible to have a shared vision for sustainability? I'm going to come back to that that comment that question in a second. Um, is there anything online that I should highlight? Uh, Hima, did you, were there some comments either in the Slido or on, uh, in the chat that you don't mind sharing on the behalf of everyone? Sure. Um, there was a question. Uh, can sustainability initiatives be integrated with core business activities rather than requiring duplicate data entry to quantify environmental outcomes? Okay. Um, and I'm guessing that this is, uh, this is a question uh, reflecting how that burden plays out on farms. It, it, am I characterizing that correctly for the for the person who provided it? It's a good comment. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the general thought of the sustainability initiatives tend to fail due to their extent, not just in terms of the cash, but mostly in terms of the time. And if we can reduce the amount of time for producers to participate, we're far more likely to get them involved. Okay. Because we have to track progress over an extended period of time, getting part of the goal one time does not get us to where we need. Thank you for that clarification. So the comment to, to back 
back up that that suggestion is that well one time adoption or enrollment or participation in a program does not translate necessarily to sustainability because we are talking about far off distant goals and it's just part of one of these out, part of part of what we're trying to do one of these challenges that we do the situation that we need to address so let's move in to the second activity because many of you have already started that in a way you've come started to come up with some great ideas as far as how can we do this what are some activities that we can do to build this community i guess i would uh what we want to do now is move into some small group discussions in the room. We are already in those small groups. Online, uh, if you'll give me a minute, what I will do is um, we are going to turn the sound off and promote everybody online to, uh, to verbal presentations. So hopefully everyone online can share amongst them. We'll turn the sound off so that they don't have to listen to us and that we don't have to listen to them. Um, <laughs> right? It goes both ways. Uh, so we can have some small group discussions. This discussion is going to be a little bit longer. You know, with this discussion, let's look at uh, 15, 20 minutes. We'll, we'll gauge how the discussion is going in each group. But we want you to look at, you know, whether it's past, present, or future activities that could foster a community of support for moving these initiatives forward. You might look at what can you do as an individual representing your organization. You might look at it as an organization or as an LPLC collective as a whole. I encourage the groups to talk about as ideas come up, is this idea transferable to the LPLC community or transferable between organizations, between states, for example? I'd encourage you to have that conversation. Um, again, look at, I, look at the ideas, ask some clarifying questions as they come up, and well, well, there was this notion of, can we make a collective vision for sustainability? I would, I would encourage us to look at it as every farm is taking their own personal journey. Every organization is going to be taking their own personal journey. As we saw from the table, just amongst um, the pork, egg and dairy groups, yes, they have different visions as to what sustainability looks like, but they were, they're, they're different for a reason. There's overlap. And I think if we look at it in, in the biggest picture possible, it's about continuous improvement. And that's always been what LPLC is about too. So how can we help, how can we help farmers on this journey? So I, I encourage the small group discussion around these activities. When we have about five minutes left, I will give everybody a warning. Give everybody a warning. And then we will uh, come back and share some of the highlights to those conversations. With the last couple of minutes here for this activity, what I'd like you to do is hopefully you have several ideas and maybe they're you know, going deep into one area or a very broad smattering of ideas. But from that list of stuff that you have hopefully written down and before you go, if you are the one that's been taking notes, if you don't mind, I'd like to get a picture of those notes just so we can document all the other great ideas that have been said. Um, the last couple of minutes, what I'd like each group to do is pick out a rose. Pick out something, a clear, vibrant example of an activity that has established value. An activity that we can use as LPLC to, to foster a community of support for these initiatives. Pick out a bud, an emerging idea that uh, has some promise, you know, and is worth nurturing. And then I'm guessing there's a thorn or two in your discussions, right? What is a thorn that we need to watch out for? So as you wrap up your conversations, if you can pick out those three things to share back to the group, I'd appreciate it. I'm gonna come back together here. I think every group has at least a couple of the, of the items identified. So we, uh, we have four groups and each group we're, we're talking through these questions and just from my peripheral hearing of, of the conversations, they were all going in very different directions, which is exciting and what we wanted, right? Uh, we wanted this, these diverse perspectives to this conversation. So again, please save your notes so that we can uh, capture more of the, of the ideas and we're able to share here. 
uh, if uh, each group doesn't mind sharing their rosebud and thorn, uh, I'll try and uh, capture some notes up here as well. Uh, Hema um, and, and group, I might just add them on as a different color in this uh, particular Jamboard to share back with everybody, uh, if that's okay. Yes, uh, yes. Actually, Hema, do you want to start? What was the rosebud and thorn that your group came up with? Sure. Um, so we we just had one stream of thought um, that I I won't take credit. It was actually Kevin's um, Kevin Lestrape's uh, thought. Although uh, anyone who knows what I worked on at EPA knows that this is uh, this is definitely singing singing my gospel of what I had to deal with at EPA. But um, so it's one idea. And within that idea, we've outlined the thorn and the rose within that idea. So um, basically the notion is to have a successful community and to encourage adoption of good practices among producers, for example, to support sustainability initiatives, you need broad and diverse stakeholders engaged. The thorn though, is that when you're trying to build a community, you need to watch out for distrust among producers for regulatory agencies like EPA and environmental NGOs. So how do you how do you have that buy-in, that diverse buy-in to lend credibility and, and knowledge or expertise to, um, to encourage the adoption of appropriate um, practices, but get over that thorn of distrust? And so the, the ROSE idea was field days that bring in NGOs and regulators as well to attend, which doesn't always happen, um, so that you can start to build dialogue, trust, and relationships to start getting that diverse um, stakeholder base for support for producers as they're in, as you want to get participation in sustainability initiatives. Kevin, um, I'm not sure if you, if you want to unmute yourself. I think you might be able to characterize it additionally if I missed anything. Oh, Hima, you did a, an excellent job. Um, so only thing I, I can, uh, add is, um, just that, that I idea of, of field days, we would, instead of them being, um, extension or academia led, I think what I've, I've seen in some of the other presentations that I thought were the most effective part were the farmer testimonies grower testimony videos that have been made. So if we had these field days at places uh, with, with early adopters and they tell their, their own story on their own place, I think it would be more effective. And, uh, you know, and it might mean that the EPA and the, and the NGO part would have to meet with that farmer earlier before the field day and kind of build a trust and relationship with them of why they're going to be there and what their goals are and and the farmer and the farmer's friends that come to the to the field day will not have a that immediate barrier to begin with you know before they even listen to anything and um or, or fear of saying anything and stuff like that of being there or being filmed and then put on a website or something like that uh, right. without their permission. So I think that would be a huge thing to add that into it is use the really good early adopters themselves would okay. be the robes because they exist. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, you, I don't know that you can see it, but there were some heads nodding um, as your, as your ideas were being brought up. So thank you, uh, Hema and Kevin and, and Michaela. I think you had uh, someone else join in there. Um, how about this table here? So our discussion centered around data. And um, so when you think about producers engaging in sustainability initiatives, they all ask for data. And um, right now, how we would define a rose is that data with permission from the farmer moves across diverse systems seamlessly. We know it is happening. We have experts at the table who are aware of those systems, um, but in the animal ag communities and across multiple commodities, we're not there yet. For a bud, we define that as a sh developing shared, defined standards of commonly collected data. 
So right now, it was brought up earlier and we talked about how many diverse initiatives are out there. We're all asking for very similar, similar data in many different areas, but we haven't all defined that data in the same manner and we're asking for it in different ways. We're asking for different standards of measurement, et cetera. Is there a way that we could all come together to commonly define those standards for that data so we can move towards common databases? The producer collects it once for one initiative and it fits any other ask that is made of them. And then the thorn in this situation with data is data privacy. Again, how do we help farmers get comfortable with understanding the value of their data and making getting them comfortable in sharing that data and understanding, obviously, the, how critical it is to all of these initiatives and um, get them comfortable with sharing it. Thank you. Any I'm seeing heads nodding, some, some agreement, some understanding of what you guys all came up with. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so uh, our discussion for the ROSE is having a common center hub to bring all of these different diverse groups together and have that kind of commonality. And we're talking about rather than reinventing the wheel, adding rubber to that, that lovely wooden wheel and uh, you know just utilizing the UN SDGs, particularly in the environmental space. They're, they're good, they're broad, and you can roll a lot of stuff up and underneath them. Um, for our bud, we actually kind of, we, we struggled on this one a little bit, but having that community discussion, um, similar to, I think what, what HEMA's group had brought up, um, but also as we're in those discussions, defining some of these challenging topics, such as what is the definition of no-till. And if you occasionally till, doing no-till, is that still no-till? Um, and I, I shared with this group, I had a challenge with a producer in South Dakota uh, who was under a no-till contract and they found out injecting manure was considered tillage um, or whoever was whoever was enforcing that contract was seen no, or as injecting manure as um, tillage. So becoming, you know, bringing those communities together and actually discussing some of these very big challenges that I think we will face as we're moving forward in this journey. Uh, and last but not least, the thorn, uh, we brought up politics, but we think politics will always be there, unfortunately. Um, but maybe moving one step, uh, you know, aside of, of politics is, is the one size fits all approach. We know the one size fits all approach does not work. Um, and we know that we're not all one size. We're all many different shapes and sizes. So we need to have those menu of options for producers to be able to pick and choose what works specifically for their operations. Oh, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. And... All right, thanks. So uh, the majority of our table uh, is from Michigan. So we were talking uh, in particular about a Michigan program that we've got, but really kind of under under the basic understanding that sustainability programs kind of have to meet this, uh, this three-legged stool that one of the farmers on the tour was talking about yesterday, that it has to make agronomic sense, it has to make environmental sense, and it has to make economic sense. Um, and so one of the things we identified as our rose is that, we, is that we've got a program in Michigan that does a lot of the bringing multiple stakeholders together and developing a common set of standards and, it, you know, and kind of developing that, you know, that language and that data collection to be able to provide a program that farmers can go through an assessment, you know, and, and get verified through this program. Um, and, you know, and so we, so we've got that program that is our rose, at least at the Michigan level. Um, and the bud that is that, you know, that is the potential with that program is that it, you know, as associated with it and associated with the standards is a lot of great regulatory program that programming that we need, or a lot of great educational programming, excuse me, that we need to get out to not only more producers, but also the rest of the stakeholders and community that are engaged in and around agriculture. Um, and the thorns really are kind of, you know, regulatory barriers to being able to do stuff that makes sense from that three-legged stool, as well as some 
some of the standards that are set in order to try to, you know, try to make the the net as wide as possible for for people to be able to find different ways to qualify is that sometimes we're sat, you know, we're sacrificing, uh, you know, the perfect in exchange for the good, but is the good that we're getting good enough? And we need to, you know, we need to figure out kind of where, you know, where the good enough is that we're actually making progress. Yeah, you can add to that. I, I think another bud that we talked about too, that it would take a lot of massaging. <laughs> um, I think we've noticed that a lot of times um, some of our organizations and agencies get very siloed. Um, and so we don't always know what the right hand is doing versus the left hand. And sometimes, I don't know, it'd be really great. Like for instance, it would be awesome if we could get some more information, like educational information to our regulatory agencies, because not all of those people know exactly what's going on in agriculture and why sometimes maybe some of the regulations, you know, the expectations here when the reality is here, you know, so how do you find that next best answer to say, okay, nope, they're not going to achieve this today, but they can achieve this. And it's at least going to get something better environmentally than what it has right now. And vice versa, there's a lot that agriculture doesn't understand about how the systems work within regulatory agencies and why they maybe have to function the way they do, or maybe not. Um, and I think it'd be really helpful if we kind of had like a sharing and caring time, if you will, where <laughs> we can all just, uh, <laughs> so we can all just get along. No, but I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I'll be sending those out soon. Um, no, it just, it'd be really nice, I think, you know, to have. Yeah. <laughs> not kidding, we're gonna see it's like the number third crop. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> um, but no, it'd be really nice if we could, you know, for a bud, have some kind of way to have the different uh, groups to speak of. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> It'd be, it'd be great if we could have some education on both sides of the, the carpet with that, because I think at least it would help with a shared understanding. You know, we may not always agree or like it, but at least we'd have an idea of why that person is the way they are in that situation. Demystify. Yeah. Where to go after that, right? Uh, sharing is caring, I think, is the, the one activity, right, that we, we take away from that conversation. I appreciate everybody sharing those ideas. Um, um, as we wrap up, you know, how do we keep, how do we keep this effort moving forward, right? We started this conversation and I think we've recognized, you know, what, what power we do have when groups like those of us in the room, right. That come from different perspectives, the power that, that we have when we bring these different perspectives together, right. And to, to build this community of support. So how do we keep this going forward? How do we, how do we keep this effort going forward? Whether, you know, it, not necessarily just an LPLC effort, but amongst our different organizations, and I think LPLC is one way to bring some of these groups together, but there are other ways. So to wrap up the presentation, what I'd ask, uh, ask you to do, if I can get back to my slide here, I'm going gonna, gonna skip, to um, skip one of the Slido questions, but I wanna to go to the question on the Slido poll and let me know if it's not active, but as an LPLC community, what do we have? Why don't you just take a minute and as, if nothing else, think about it from an LPLC community, from what we have in this room, what do we have already? What do we have for building this community of support? So if you're wondering what is coming up, uh, So what do we have was the question. What we have coming in is <laughs> we want to keep eating. Good. Right. We've heard that a couple of times, I think, in uh, presentations today. We have a website. Uh, someone noted that, you know, we have some 
very common goals, right? Maybe not to the nearest uh, decimal point as to what a goal metric might be, but we have some common goals amongst LPLC as well as the industry initiatives. Unbiased facts. This is what we have. My next question is what do we need? So I love the ideas that are coming in here as to what we need. Some of them I was kind of expecting, funding. I was kind of expecting that one to come through, right? But um, cooperation. I think that's something that we've, we've started to build, but we can always do more. Increasing trust that's come through, I think, throughout today. Um, but what we have here is what we've started to put together are some of those ultimately outcomes, right? Or how we get to those outcomes, what we need to overcome our challenges or our situation in order to get to those outcomes. So what are the next steps for today? You can keep adding to this to your heart's content, right? But what are our next steps? Well, if, like I said, if you're willing to share your, um, put this on here. If you're willing to share some of your notes, um, willing to take those, put them together in a document so that we have something shared. We have something on eventually on the LPLC site, the proceedings for this workshop that any and all of us can go back to. For example, if anyone is working on a proposal, right, for an extension activity, you now have a document to reference that says this is a need, right? A multi-group multi-stakeholder group came together and identified these items. I think it gives, um, hopefully, Michelle, Marguerite, uh, Hema, gives some other perspectives also from, from where your agencies or organizations are at, where there's information gaps or where there's, where there's some other holes that, that can be filled as well. But ultimately, I think what we're all looking for is more cooperation. So with the contact information that was shared, I'll share back the, the, the collective documents for editing, additions. Do we keep this conversation going, right? Do we, have, do we have a webinar? Do we have a meeting in the coming months to come back to this and explore some other ideas? Um, don't have a lot of time left today to go through some of those ideas, but I hope through the rest of the conference, um, as you're seeing any, uh, any of us uh, with either with LPLC or uh, Hema, Marguerite, Michelle, you know, let's have these conversations. Let's figure out some ways that we can move this forward. With that, I'll close up today. I appreciate again, uh, Michelle, Marguerite, Hema for being part of this, helping organize and get these questions going to for facilitate this discussion. Appreciate the online audience participating in a, in a workshop format. I know it's not always easy, but I appreciate, uh, appreciate you having those conversations and keeping it going there. Thank you, everybody, for your participation, and that's it for today.